Uh, I now have the privilege of introducing our first panel uh, moderator for the day. Uh, professor Rainer Kattel is a professor of innovation and public governance at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose from UCL. Uh, so Rainer, please uh, introduce your first panel and the panelists. Yeah, hi everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a great to see how the uh, Center of Excellence, uh, Finest Twins, has been growing over the last uh, two years. Uh, I had the pleasure uh, of being at the, at the very beginning of it, uh, maybe six seven years ago. By now, I think with Ralph Martin, who's also here, and Rope, who's on the panel as well. So this uh, it's, it has been a long journey, but yeah, it's uh, it's great to see this uh, cross border smart city uh, cooperation actually. Uh, coming off crown and of course this is a particularly challenging because it's a cross-border uh, solution and between two small countries so uh, it is a, a particularly challenging but uh, it's great to see how it uh, how it's going yeah so we have a our first panel is uh, is is on the on the issue of citizen-centric smart so, smart city solutions and governance so I think while in in the program it doesn't have a question mark I think you probably should put a question mark behind it are actually smart city solutions often uh, citizen centric or are they actually much more centered on technology companies or or just uh, a, um, a a city government and let them think you know do things e more easily rather than actually being citizen centered so before i um i, I go to uh, to our, and introduce our panelists uh, um indeed uh, i think what we try to do today is is to to look at both uh, sort of the bigger framings around citizens and smart cities um, in terms of uh, like digital rights and, and, and data commons and, and things like that, but also really talk about various uh, practical solutions, practical examples that our panelists uh, um, can bring from their own uh, uh, working life and experience. So we hope to have it as a, a combined conversation around you know, bigger framings uh, and, and also uh, more detailed practical uh, solutions. And as you know, of course, there has been, particularly in the European Union, a lot of discussion recently about digital economy, both before and after COVID. It has, but also in terms of uh, trying to compete with uh, with the US and China and trying to think about industrial policy in this context again, but also in terms of actually creating sustainable cities. And, and so European Union has been a, or has become actually a great champion of these, uh, these issues. And it's great to see that there are various cities from 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 paris to stockholm really trying to think about not only about using digital technology to make cities uh, as it were more comfortable to use but also actually to make it more tense you know one minute city 15 minute cities all these ideas of actually recapturing the city space for the citizens it's great to see that the european commission and, and and european cities are at the forefront of this so but our panel today I'll do a very brief introduction of uh, of all the panelists, and then I'll come to each of you, uh, because each of you had a uh, uh, given us a sentence uh, that uh, you know, all the people in the audience can find in the in the in the program. I will read this sentence that you gave uh, us, and then I will ask you to comment on it, expand on it, and I will I might ask you uh, some questions as well. Uh, and so each of you has around three to five minutes. Uh, we can be quite flexible with that. And of course, then I will also ask you to um, think about, listen to other panelists as well. So if you have any questions uh, to them or if you want to comment there. And uh, I also invite all the people in the audience and there, there are a lot of people here in the Zoom room, but there's also people in the, in the YouTube channel, I think. And so if you have any questions, comments, please, please put them in the, in the chat. And I can, um, I, can, I can then ask our panelists to, to answer these, these uh, questions as well. So our panel um, includes uh, Signe Razzo, was, uh, who just had a, a great introduction uh, to this uh, conference today. And so I don't, I don't need to reintroduce you, Signe. So welcome uh, to our panel. Uh, second panelist is Francesca Bria. Uh, she is at the moment the uh, president of the Italian in National Innovation Fund. And um, previously, um, she was the chief technology officer at the city of Barcelona and was really spearheading uh, many of the digital solutions that Barcelona has become famous for. Uh, but also she is not only a practitioner of, of smart city solutions, and she's also been 
really at the, at the cutting edge of, uh, of academic discussions around smart city and, and data rights, data commons, technology, technology sovereignty, and, and all these issues. So welcome, Francesca. Glad you're, you can be here with us today. And next, I come to Raiko Pustisma, who is a housing expert at the Estonian Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communication. And at the moment, uh, dealing with uh, various spatial challenges, I guess, of Estonian cities. And there are a number of them, uh, as, as many of you, uh, many of you know, but also Raiko has been involved with, uh, with uh, wider strategic planning uh, previously uh, for Estonia 2035. Uh, with, with the Minister of um, Finance um, as well. And next up is uh, Janus Mür. Uh, Janus is a PhD student at the uh, Tallinn University of, of Technology, also, of course, part of the Central Excellence. And uh, I think that we are here um, uh, talking today about. And uh, Janus has both background in public administration, but also innovation policy and has worked with the city of Tallinn and also has been involved in various smart city um, and projects before. So welcome, Janus, uh, to you as well. And last but not least, we have uh, Rope Ritos. And Rope, uh, uh, as I said um, briefly in the beginning, of course, has been um, a part of this uh, Smart City uh, Center of Excellence, Finest Twins, since the very inception with Ralph Martin uh, Soa, who's also on the background here. Hi, Martin. Uh, hi, Ralph. And, um, and Rob, uh, today uh, he works at uh, Temos Helsinki, but before that he was Forum Virium, uh, which is the city of Helsinki's uh, enterprise uh, and really um, innovation enterprise. So welcome, Rob. So I'll, I come to, I think I start with you, Francesca. So um, if you come from the, I think you come from the first, um, although we are in the, in the, in the same room <laughs> in Zoom, but I mean, you come uh, to us, I think, from Rome today, so it's, uh, it's you know, it's not that far, but uh, so I think, um, uh, and given you uh, are here, so um, you gave us the following quote, uh, we need to put technology and data at the service of people and the ecological transition, digital humanism, preserving citizens' digital rights and their data sovereignty. So this is a digital humanism. This is something that uh, is a concept that you have been leading on uh, with, with various other uh, thinkers, but also I think you have been practicing that, especially in Barcelona and later on in other cities as well. So maybe you can expand on this idea of digital humanism. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Rainer. And it is a real pleasure to be uh, in this panel with all of you. Always uh, really um, exciting to see um, Nordic uh, cities and the, the kind of Nordic eco innovation ecosystem coming together and thinking really in, a, in an integrated and coherent way looking at the future. So it is a pleasure to uh, contribute to this conversation. So I think I will start kick off um, talking a little bit also about what I've heard in the previous um, speech from the European Commission at the introduction of this uh, conference, because I think um, when we think about uh, digital um, humanism or technological uh, humanism, what, we, what I really mean is moving away from technological solutionism, in fact, in the, in the very first place. So we, I think we, we have to really be very clear that when we are talking about smart cities, but when we are talking about any kind of uh, technological infrastructure and data-driven solutions in today's uh, society, uh, we cannot just accelerate uh, digitization. We cannot just accelerate uh, technology being pervasively part of our life. We need to give it a direction, which means um, that we want to, uh, first of all, uh, achieve um, sustainability from a, an environmental perspective, but also a social perspective. So social and environmental sustainability, but also that is very important to understand that it's not technology driving uh, what exactly we need, but that it's we need to put at the very center the big challenges of our time. And the first, of course, being decarbonization and the climate crisis, but also public health care, improving mobility, improving uh, our cities, improving democracy. And, and at the very core, I think, of this transformation, at, uh, as it was said in the introduction, there is the question of citizens being able to uh, participate and shape 
the future of their cities. And this is because, of course, if you talk about how we uh, improve CO, uh, how we decrease CO2 emission, how we move to net zero targets, how we, you know, we tackle pollution and um, we improve mobility, healthcare, education. I mean, all the basic things of life of citizens. Of course, people that are affected by these decisions should be part of the process. So we are actually not just, you know, thinking about future technological standards and future technology systems, we are shaping the future of our cities. And we have to do it very clearly through a large scale democratic movement to a large scale democratic process. So I think that's where we started actually also in Barcelona. And the, and the question was, is uh, also the public sector able to do that? Because we always kind of assume that the problem is citizens not being able to participate and not being able to be part of shaping the process and also shaping the solutions. Because um, you know there is um, not technological neutrality in that sense. So technology is not neutral. It depends, you know, the kind of social, economic, and political questions, and it depends on the models that you apply. So citizens should be part of this conversation, and uh, and so, for example, in Barcelona, when we did it, we uh, the mayor was really uh, critically involved. I mean, I think you need high level commitment from the policymakers to um, to agree that collective intelligence is the way to go when we take political decisions. And of course, their technology and data can help us to unleash the kind of collective intelligence power that we have in society. So I come to the second point because I know, I know we have a short introduction uh, to make. So the, the, the question here centrally to the smart city uh, conversation is having said that it's not technological solutionism and it, it is about uh, you know, shaping and involving citizens in giving a direction to where we want to go, achieving sustainability, environmental and social, and uh, and you know and solving the real questions of our times. The, the other big thing is how do we democratize technology and data? So how do we make sure we regain democratic control of um, technological infrastructure? And in particular, as you said. Um, when you were introducing me, I worked a lot on the question of data democracy and data commons. So understanding that data can be perceived today, definitely so in the digital economy as the raw material of the digital economy that fuels artificial intelligence, that is the very core, it's a critical resource of our time and data can be used for the public interest, for the public good. So we shouldn't just understand data as a resource to be exploited and you know, monetized by actually um, an, olig an oligopoly because at the moment we have a problem of market concentration, of course, when we look at the digital economy, but we can democratize democratize data and unleash the real power of citizens. So for me, a very interesting question, which also ties to the question of digital rights, of course, because data, uh, it, it's, it's also about how do we respect and preserve the fundamental constitutional rights of citizens and our European values and principles. And I, I was really glad to see that the European Commission yesterday launched the declaration on digital rights and principles. I think we, we did it in Barcelona. We were pioneering that with uh, the city of New York and Amsterdam and the city's Coalition for Digital Rights, which is backed by UN Habitat and many other cities. So I think we paved the way and show that you can do it bottom up. But now that the European Commission put its weight in such a very important process, we have really the first continent that is saying, you know, we have our values and principle and direction and we are going there. So the digital rights are at the very core of how we understand um, our digital world, our digital society. So just uh, I, I end by saying for me, an absolutely interesting space. I'm also now working with the city of Hamburg on very interesting projects there is the intersection between data democracy and data sovereignty, even pioneering new technological solutions that are decentralized privacy announcing and rights preserving, which enable people to decide how they want to share data, they want to keep data private with cryptography, how they want to share it for the public good, and the intersection of that and the net zero targets. So can we really, able? are we able to mobilize the power of technology and data to achieve 
the net zero objectives. And there I think uh, we can then go and move in a conversation of also talking about real experimentations and services and solution that I think can emerge at the intersection of the green deal, the green transition and the net zero targets where cities are absolutely critical. I don't think we can achieve the um, green deal if we don't start from the communities, from cities, from places where it's going to be very tangible, the transformation that we are going to achieve, changing mobility, uh, changing um, you know, energy consumption and production, changing, you know, the very foundation of the built environment, because that's where the problems are with CO2 emissions and how we leverage the power, democratic power of data and technology to do that. So I think this kind of conversation for me, yes, part large scale democratic participation, data democracy, data sovereignty, and how do we link it with our main goal, which is to achieve the net zero, uh, net zero goals in cities and I think this is a, a absolutely a critical space to see where cities are going to be at the at the forefront in showing what what it can be possible. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, great opening uh, for our panel. And I'll, I'll come to Rope to you actually because uh, what you have given us as your sentence is uh, is uh, is perhaps uh, slightly provocative, especially on the back uh, on the background of, of what Francesca was just uh, talking about. So. I read the sentence uh, UK was open, and so you can you can comment and expand on it. And um, so I quote: "Cities are the main stage for the play where we, the people, try to solve the global climate inequality crisis. Sometimes adding smartness, testing innovations, and asking citizens for opinions leads to outcomes that act, that actually hinder, not help, to solve this crisis. We need radically improved ways for joint action to meet the urgency needed. So maybe you can." expand on, on that uh, idea of how the citizen engagement might actually not be helping the way we are doing it at the moment, at least. Thank you, uh, Rainer, Francesca. Uh, I think uh, uh, very uh, happy to be here and, and good question. Uh, happy to build on Francesca. Uh, so. Um, maybe uh, I start with like, like with the like grandiose thing. So we all know the digital innovation will hopefully transform the society at large. So some kind of change is coming and the role of innovation is that a lot of the change or the outcomes should come as a surprise because it's innovation. We don't know how things are going to go. So that's the very nature of the innovation. Uh, uh, and then the uh, innovation uh, being political. So, so not naturally uh, neutral regarding the outcome. So it has the direction and speed, speed where we are going. Uh, so building on, on what, Francesca told, but then, then um, uh, as a designer, I, I think the governance aspect, this, this is really interesting because uh, from the design and training, I, I, what I've, I've been kind of learned, learned that the devil is in the details of the methods and structures and activities where we do innovation, how we do innovation, especially if we empower the citizen for the co-creation. Uh, so how we actually uh, empower the citizens for the co-creation uh, so that it's, it doesn't end up in the scene what some people call participation washing, uh, for, for example. And my experience from the co-creation side, uh, side, side is that also, also kind of it's both political as well as like the innovation itself. And then it's kind of our author the scoping exercise for, for many in the, in the administration. So what is put, put under or in the co-creation? Uh, the, the, uh, then it's uh, kind of also always a hot topic and it's a bit like hidden under the lid of, of the processes. So both the theme uh, and then the like options given like what you are allowed to co-create co-create in and there's a lot, lot of discourse like in the policy making and then the living lab scene and the participatory budgeting side what what what's the state of pair and where it should go but maybe for, for this crowd I, I think and for me as well so so we work on the fussy front and the innovation and the smart cities i suppose so it's not always evident uh, how how we would should, should go about it and my my, uh, my my interpretation is that we live in a kind of a bit like old fashioned narrative uh, around this at, at the moment. So so uh, so so everyone talks about the city should present the problems, their problems as challenges, and then ask for the solutions from the markets, from the companies, start to create the solutions for these problems. And then the cities, the citizens play just a role of like user testers of, of the startup in, innovators. And that's like how we solve the co-creation done. And we have empowered the citizen and this doesn't work. Uh, so so it, it, it has failed both of the impact as well as in the societal outcomes as we see. And if you look at like a lot of the agile piloting taking place in the, around the Europe in the past. So, so you don't uh, end up with actual solutions in real life and you don't end up with the solutions at the scale. And I think it's like based on a failed 
assumptions uh, that, that uh, some some uh, magical young startup entrepreneur can uh, kind of device as a future that we would actually want want. Uh, so so uh, that and I, I think the solution should be that we should somehow like go go beyond that uh, the, the, that so, so uh, uh, we need to change the paradigm of the cities being the mass passive test pads which is uh, I think also the finest has a little bit also that in the corners uh, and the innovation happens just magically outside the cities cities so so, so that doesn't work uh, it's evident in like the data ecosystem it's evident in the mobility ecosystems it's evident maybe in the energy side as well so so uh, so uh, that we need to work on and then i think i think uh, another thing we are lacking lacking is some kind of long term positive visions for the smart cities so so we haven't uh, describe how the smart city of the future, good smart city would look like, especially being very explicit about the political and cultural aspect of, of, of the smart city. So there is no discourse for like what's a smart city for a say, leftist government of 2050 or what's a smart city for the, uh, 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 that, you know, Nordic, Nordic smart city visions in, in a detail that's meaningful for, for somebody to actually follow. And I think a lot of the governance issues fail because we don't uh, uh, we don't grasp about what, what needs to be governed, governed. And then really interesting leads on that. So so and methodology again. So so sorry for being a designer, but but for example the pentahelix pentahelix concept uh, by Igor Gautzer, a way you kind of actually structurally try to empower citizen activists uh, as as you do with the companies. It's one lead, and then the other thing we are looking quite a bit is the data feminism starting point where we were kind of very explicitly start to examine and challenge power and the hierarchies and binaries around the, around the kind of data stuff. So maybe that that's where I stop now. Good. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, this is uh, it's a very good complementary uh, to Francesca's uh, um, beginning uh, intervention. I come to now the signal so to go back to the European level again because. You gave us a, a, a quote about uh, uh, citizens and the government. So uh, let me let me read your quote and then I'll ask you to expand on that. So you said trust is a two way street. Uh, citizens trust the governments if the government showed trust in citizens opinions. Uh, combining our R&I investments uh, with active citizen engagement, we will increase trust in new solutions and achieve much bigger or much higher impact. This is what the, yeah, our new EU missions are about for and with the citizens. And as you said in the beginning, that this is an ongoing process at the moment. And, and yeah, I, I think I, I'd like to ask you to expand on this um, from perhaps on the, from the European perspective as well. How can we increase the, 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 the two-way street, uh, the trust uh, between uh, uh, the citizen and the government, and especially from the perspective that Francesca and, and uh, Rob were just talking about, which is actually really democratizing these processes around data uh, rather than tokenistically uh, think, talking about it. Well, well, many, many thanks. Uh, I was listening very carefully uh, um, to what Frances uh, Francesca and, and Rope said, and, and I think it's, it's good also uh, to have um, uh, some kind of um, also the, uh, uh, the, the real discussion and, and different views as, 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 we, uh, as we heard. So perhaps first I, I come to just to expanding a bit to my, uh, my ideas, but then I'd, I'd really like to make use of the the city's mission so far, perhaps then uh, also to comment of, uh, at some of the points that uh, that uh, that Rob uh, gave. And as to Francesca, well, certainly now these human-centered approaches are for the uh, for the EU, for the Commission, everywhere. Uh, well, we, we talk about a human-centered uh, AI. Well, everything related to data. So this is really at the at the center of attention. Uh, but now coming to uh, the, the participation of citizens, uh, clearly over the last um, uh, years, there has been a very clear recognition uh, of the need uh, to link research better with societies, with people, and also to aim for higher societal impact. And uh, especially in the light uh, of the necessary uh, green and digital uh, transitions to which also a finest smart city uh, center is, is very closely linked to. So it has brought understanding uh, that doing science and creating new knowledge is not an aim itself, but it really uh, is a means uh, to help um, societies to tackle economic, environmental and societal um, challenges. Uh, and really we need true partnership with citizens 
but this uh, requires a well uh, working uh, trust based relationship. And it also needs sustained collaboration between uh, institutions and their citizens. We, in order to make it work, uh, it's not just to mobilize the citizens, but it also needs uh, the agile governments, uh, which are uh, then uh, able to embrace the ideas that come from the citizens. So it, it really needs to be a, a two-way um, two uh, street. Uh, and uh, also what I'd like to underline is engagement with citizens also means that the governments are ready to experiment that they are ready also to fail. Uh, and uh, uh, we really need this kind of dedicated capacities in the, uh, in the civil service uh, to, to make it work, whether it's at the governmental level or it's at the, at the cities level, when, as, we, I, as we speak about cities, uh, cities here. And, uh, and this is the, really the main reason why we've, we've also created uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, the new tool uh, the Horizon Europe missions. Uh, we, we are speaking here now about the city's mission, uh, but there are also uh, four other uh, missions which were, which were launched, uh, launched uh, for the climate adaptation uh, related to healthy oceans, healthy uh, soil and food uh, and cancer. And uh, the, really the idea came uh, from the uh, mission to the moon uh, uh, under, which was launched as we know by, by President uh, John Kennedy in the United States, uh, how to mobilize the whole societies in order to, to find solutions to the big challenges and how to do that together with the, uh, with the citizens. Uh, now, uh, just uh, to give you an example uh, based on the, on the city's mission. What we did uh, in the conceptual phase uh, in the city's mission, we organized 13 citizen engagement events across uh, EU member states, uh, namely in order to, uh, to design uh, the mission, uh, which takes into account uh, the experience of the, of the people uh, in cities and uh, polled uh, on their personal priorities uh, towards climate neutrality, uh, now, uh, the overwhelming uh, number of citizens indicated, uh, uh, namely, uh, what are the key priorities? Uh, mobility, energy, urban infrastructure, behavioral change as key uh, priorities. Uh, and so these are actually now also the, 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 were the basis of, of designing uh, the, uh, the mission. Uh, but uh, the participation of citizens is not over with that. Uh, but what do we also expect that in the, uh, in the implementation phase, they will also participate there uh, in order to experiment the solutions, but also to, to find uh, perhaps the, the new solutions. Uh, now, coming to, to what Roper said, uh, well, I, I, I picked up a, a bit of um, inconsistency on what you said. Well, well you, you, you said that we really need to have a long-term vision. Well, clearly. And the long-term uh, vision, well, part of that is, is clearly this climate neutrality uh, by, by 20, uh, 2050, which is the, uh, really the, uh, the, the big, uh, big ambition. But how to get there, uh, we, we, we don't know yet, because as you also said, innovation should also contain a surprise. So we expect also to have some uh, surprises in, in our way, uh, really, to, to, to see what would be then the, 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 the best solutions but also the solutions that could be scaled up at the European level. And now as with the, the, the finest uh, project is also something which, uh, which aims, uh, aims to do that. Uh, now, just very, um, very quickly, perhaps we can also come back to, to some of the issues later, but what I'd also like to mention is the um, European Capital of Innovation Awards, uh, which we've been awarded uh, since 2014. Uh, uh, which uh, really uh, get uh, the, 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 the cities uh, which convene local innovation ecosystems, uh, bring together the, the citizens, civil society organizations, local industry and businesses uh, to find solutions on their urban environments uh, are the, those which uh, have been awarded uh, so far. And uh, what I'd uh, like also to highlight that, uh, that um, I also, call relevant cities uh, working in the in the finest also to consider already their application 
uh, for the uh, 2022 uh, award, um, award uh, call. Perhaps I can come back to some other elements a bit later. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much, Signa. And uh, I think Robert can respond uh, perhaps later uh, to Signa's uh, Signa's point. So, <clears throat> Signa, you, you mentioned something that is I think very relevant for for Janos's intervention. So, Janos, you're up next. Uh, Agile government, uh, namely, and Janos, your quotation for us uh, before the conference is, I quote: "I think oftentimes city pilots, cities pilot different smart solutions just to look innovative to their citizens." If you have a closer look, cities do not learn much from such pilots. If city administrations really aim to improve public services and the life of the residents, then they need to be more inclusive and think more about the design of the pilots. So perhaps you can expand on, 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 on this viewpoint and uh, and what would be your also recommendations, I guess, at this point. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, uh, I hope that quote didn't sound too cynical. Uh, but I think um, it also links nicely with uh, some of the Francesca's uh, ideas. Uh, I really believe that technology needs a direction and the direction from the citizens. But uh, the prerequisite for it is, in my opinion, that the cities themselves can meaningfully participate in these different technology pilots, which uh, sometimes is uh, not the case. Uh, if you look at how these pilots are often designed, then yes, officially the cities are partners, they have some uh, responsibilities, etc. But if we, if we go like deeper inside, then these tasks uh, that the cities themselves are responsible for in these pilots do not provide much knowledge about the technology, which is actually necessary if the city plans to um, adopt the technology in the future. So I think we first need to think about how cities or the cities themselves need to think about how they can meaningfully participate in these different innovative uh, initiatives. And after that, maybe uh, we should go a step further and uh, try looking at how we can uh, better include the citizens uh and uh, what are the citizens needs so that's uh i think my main uh idea and uh but yeah because right now how it looks like is that yes cities come up with the problem um then they ask the market to provide some kind of a technological solution but all the how to say the cities don't really try to give too much input into these companies and the companies just develop the technology the way they want and they think uh, it's good for them and uh, it's profitable for them. So we really need to think how cities themselves could first meaningfully participate in pilots. Thank you so much, uh, Jans, and then we'll come back to, to these issues. But now we come to uh, last but not least, uh, Raika, to you and uh, continuing very much on this topic of uh, of trust and then uh, I guess also the sense of belonging. So I'll, I, I quote uh, what you gave us uh, before the conference, the feel of belonging and connection with the neighborhood creates the strongest motivation that drives local engagement in city development. The question is on how to create and convert that motivation into better homes and well-planned city. So you're very much talking about this, uh, actually that the engagement is also the reflection of how do we actually live or create our cities rather than just being a, a sort of a, a ephemeral thing that we talk about but it's actually also a physical thing yes uh, thank you uh, everybody I, I tried to be with this spot uh, quite critical so i could go either way to... <laughs> but uh <clears throat> yes um what i meant for the quote to be uh, more exact is that uh, as um, we are dealing with uh, you know as already uh, others said we are dealing with uh, uh, this 2050 target. We are talking about the renovation wave, Green Deal, all these important uh, long-term goals that we have ahead. And uh, the and the one main outcome of this is uh, actually the the change will appear mostly on the, each citizen's level and in the city level. 
Uh, and in the in the case of if we're talking about the renovation wave and we're talking about what I'm dealing with is how to motivate and how to support uh, the energy efficiency of the housing. Uh, it's really important uh, the engagement uh, by the dwelling owners. And uh, as the case is in uh, Estonia, for example, and many other countries is that uh, actually we have a pretty good as we had the, the mentioning of the democracy, then I would say we have a small democracies uh, in all of the apartment buildings in Estonia mostly. So, uh, so, the, uh, um, so the solutions of uh, what to do, uh, how to do on a house, housing level, it's, uh, it's quite demo, uh, democratic, uh, democratic process. But uh, also what is important, uh, but, uh, what should be mentioned is that, uh, yes, the important part is uh, the empowerment of the citizens. It's important for the local uh, municipalities to have a meaningful uh, participation in the pilots and uh, to actually try to um, uh, take into practice these innovative pilots. But um, I see there is also important role uh, by the central government level in the sense that what we are doing in the on the ministry level is uh, we are really trying to thrive and support all the new initiatives uh, and innovations also on the local municipalities level. And what is also important part of these uh, pilots and uh, efficiencies and, and ideas is the data behind it. And uh, we would see based on the pilots that and projects that we are also doing on the ministry level, for example, we have a, a project we're trying to map uh, the whole Estonia to see where are the empty dwellings in each building. So it's pretty precise uh, overview of the whole Estonia. And, and we can already see many challenges and obstacles uh, beforehand. For example, how do we integrate different data into meaningful uh, outcome? How can we transfer, uh, for example, the data of electricity, data of residency industry, data of everything else that also local municipalities only own, for example, the garbage uh, disposal, et cetera. So it's a, it's a really interesting, but, but this is the challenging part because uh, I think to have better uh, engagement and better outcomes also means that we need to have a, a well-integrated data and uh, the ability to um, read it and not just to give it to the, uh, it, it's not important just to give the challenge to the uh, private uh, entities who would then look for the solutions, but it's also uh, important to give them quality data and quality information that the outcomes would be more meaningful and the outcomes would really become more seriously you know, in, in uh, real life practice. Um, so I would, I would say that um, uh, on that sense, we're also um, on the country level when we're talking about uh, the development and, and that the support on the data say uh, important part is also uh, from our minister side to digitalize uh, the building sector. And the idea, main idea behind that is also to provide better data and the data will also provide help to all the important parties who are really responsible influencing the uh, built environment. And we have really many counterparties who are dealing with this. So I would say that the challenge itself, it's uh, it's really difficult. I mean, there's uh, a lot of controversies interfering, but it's important to have uh, an underlying uh, values and, and, and uh, logic, uh, how we actually change the built environment. How do we uh, try these innovations into real life and how do we um, try to cooperate with each other? And this is also why one of the main, um, main projects uh, we are starting now is also uh, rephrasing or, or not rephrasing, but uh, more than analyzing and trying to put uh, the information today we know all the challenges with that we have in spatial planning, for example, and spatial development. We are uh, focusing on how to change the strategic level all, uh, mm -hmm. also uh, in, in the sense of the uh, uh, state planning to create um, more suitable environment uh, for these local initiatives and the local government's initiatives ideas mm. to finalize in, uh, in, um, in a new projects and uh, the innovation and to, to support this unknown innovation part that uh, Signa uh, well put that uh, there's unknown um, solutions, but we should create the suitable environment for that. 
So um, thank you for the intro. Thank you for this. So we have heard from the panel, and uh, as, you, as you see, there is a, a, a I think there's a quite an interesting consensus emerging, if you will. But uh, I ask for the panelists if you if you want to react to something you heard from others. I think Rope, you had some specific uh, comment uh, comments directed to you. But anybody else, if you want to raise your hand, uh, uh, let me know if you want to react quickly. And then we can go to the questions. We have already a number of questions in the chat, and we can take them. So Rope, if you want to react. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, maybe briefly, and, and thanks for the remarks. Remarks, and happy to be also uh, somewhat in one of the climate mission operations with the net zero cities, where we are as well involved, especially this domain. Maybe I, maybe I, I, I uh, try to explain through through the case. Uh, so, so what I. Uh, try to uh, point out is that uh, uh, despite having this uh, very good like high level emissions okay we need to be climate neutral and then the mobility needs to be climate neutral and then we need to add democracy in data uh, so despite that uh, uh, when you go like uh, two levels up on the levels of say government policies the other kind of actual real life things and the real life policies start to drive in different directions uh, but both in the data but also the climate climate science so the one ministry will Oh, I think it. Yeah, I think it's, it's not me that frozen. It's Rob. Uh, the 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 uh, transition. So, so, so they ended in done. So, with the mechanisms, how to kind of manage this political part of the uh, activity, activity quite well. Uh, and then uh, regarding the smart cities, uh, smart cities and the like, uh, letting the company solve solve the, uh, these challenges. I think a good example is the uh, outside the data is the AI and the autom autonomous mobility, mobility where the kind of the market investments and the market innovations revolve around the kind of how we uh, make the private car as, as like smooth and automated and effective as possible and, and, and uh, electric of, of course on, on the go but that doesn't solve the like mobility challenges of the cities cities so what happens to the cities and actually that's the cities who have been funding the like robot minibus uh, pilots and, uh, and uh, R&D in the Europe <clears throat> Europe which I find a bit curious so why would cities fund this development it's, it's because the market is not creating solutions for what they need for the mobility and i think the re reason for this is that we lack the kind of visions for the smart cities for the mobility that the citizens want in, in future uh, so we have this numeral numeral targets uh, reducing the co2 but that doesn't translate into action unless we have a better smarter governance structures to tackle that exactly and i think you can also have quite a lot of like greenwashing in many ways i think that, that looks like it's a, it's a sustainable solution but it's actually actually really not i think Signa, you want to come to yeah, please. And Francesca, go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, many thanks. Uh, well, also uh, thanks, uh, thanks to to Robert for this um, the the additional comment. Uh, well, certainly uh, there should be the the connection, and also the the other uh, the speakers spoke about the connection between the government policy, between the plans uh, at the uh, at the at the local at the at the city level. Uh, and also then uh, the connection what the what the the businesses and the innovators do and uh, what i wanted also to uh, to mention that as part of our missions uh, it's it's not just uh, the uh, the the research and innovation part even if they are part of our uh, research and innovation program but also you you need to bring also the public policies uh, into the picture uh, well uh, now taking another example of another uh, mission that is cancer mission uh, well, certainly where there is the ambition of how many uh, lives we'd like to, to save, uh, but it's clear that you also need the, the health policies uh, in, in order to support that. When we come to the, the citizens level, the, the energy solutions, uh, the mobility solutions, well, they, they also need the, uh, the uh, well, first uh, the um, uh, agreements at the political level, but also huge invest, investments in infrastructure. For instance, if you'd like to, uh, to, to move to hydrogen-based uh, public transport, uh, for instance, in your city, well, certainly then you also need uh, the decisions at the governmental level and the infrastructure in order to, to be able to do that. Or uh, if uh, taking uh, the, uh, uh, the, the building um, uh, um, uh, area that uh, that uh, Raiko described. Well, certainly uh, the, the same uh, the, the same is is true there as well. Certainly, there should be very cl uh, clear uh, connection uh, between these. Thank you, Thank you uh, Francesca. 
Yes, I think I wanted to uh, make a point also on this question of the pilots and um, and is it good for cities or, and how do we scale, but it's not only a question of scale, I think it's more a question of, in, I mean, what Rope is saying, I think it's, it's integration with public service delivery within a vision, a plan for how the city should be operating next once you unleash the innovation with some form of challenges or with some form of innovative solution. I think this has been one of the critical points of uh, smart city failures in the past, uh, because we've done a lot of test beds and tests and, um, you know, uh, small pilots that maybe resulted in some um, dying hardware somewhere without sustainability and without also real solving the actual, you know, mobility challenges or the real public service delivery sustainability. And um, I think this is a, a massive question. And I think um, I wanted to stress on maybe a governance aspect of this. I think uh, we are talking about, okay, um, the, the private sector can come in with some um, innovative solution. I mean, in particular startups or innovators um, and so on, but also of course the big industry. Usually though, the big industry has a push towards cities. No, we know that it's like the smart cities has been for a long time, some kind of, you know, the city is the client of uh, corporate solutions, which are already out there and which are marketed to push against cities, even if cities, you know, that's not what they need, or even if the problem is much more complex, like in the case what Reichel was presenting, you know, affordable housing and um, and greening the, the entire kind of energy ecosystem around the built environment, and which is a very complex kind of issues where, you know, you don't just need the private sector to push uh, solutions, but you actually need the governance. I think, uh, at a technology level, what, for example, the European Commission should, could help a lot, and this is also uh, about a little bit of, um, when, when we talk about European technological sovereignty, also we talk about some of those problems. I mean, meaning that you would like to see or we would like to see for a long time some common open and interoperable standards and infrastructures uh, for the you know, 500 million European citizens. So we are relying, of course, a lot on the kind of um, private um, um, big tech solutions here. And we are not building this kind of stable uh, public led, you know, infrastructures on top of which you can build innovation in all, the, in all these different areas where the challenges then also from the private sector would make sense. And for example, uh, I mean, we struggle to do that from the data sent from the cloud uh, to the software, to the hardware. I mean, we struggle to have uh, to, let's say, have some governance over the stack. But also I think what cities could really do is this kind of European data trust model. I mean, there, uh, of, of course, like Finland and uh, Estonia, I mean, you have a lot of experience, but I think we are still missing, you know, now the commission, of course, has a very strong regulation and all these European data spaces, but I think we are still missing really a kind of, um, maybe maybe should be a pub, like a, a, a a data trust with public lead, because of course, how, how do you do it otherwise with this kind of uh, public service delivery uh, where the data is really uh, owned uh, by European citizens? So where we maintain the sovereignty over this data. I mean, I think this is a big question because of course we cannot avoid to, to ask who owns the infrastructure. And even like before listening to how it is important when you go to the data integration of many different aspects, for example, for the, for the affordable housing and the, you know, and the renovation, the energy efficiency uh, of housing, of course, the, and then the mobility challenge that Rope is talking about, uh, how can we make sure that we also redistribute the value? And to redistribute the value, which is of course economic and environmental and social value, but to redistribute this value, I think we have to be able to have a governance, a governance um, approach that's very solid. And I think here, 
uh, obviously what can come out is, okay, what's the role of the public sector in this, right? We cannot just be clients for uh, private solutions that never scale, don't integrate and don't transform the life of citizens. So I leave it there, but I think of course, these are big questions and, uh, the, and, and you know, if cities continue to experiment, because we said it before, you need to experiment, be able to fail, yes, but if you do all this experimentation, but then you don't consolidate your capacity to actually govern and sustain over time and to scale to deliver better integrated services and to deliver value to society that produces value in the first place so to deliver public value i think we're still not there yeah that's an excellent point so uh, janus and Reiko, do you want to come in and then comment on uh, on what you have heard from others so far yeah uh talk again about uh, experimentation i think um you know, uh, we have all these kinds of uh, lists that try to rank cities based on how smart they are. And one of the indicators is actually the number of experiments. So experimenting itself becomes uh, a goal. Not The goal is not to have something meaningful out from these experiments, but just to do experiments. That's the goal. And I think uh, that's partly the issue why cities have have uh, problems to think further what will we, what will be the next step that we will do to actually i don't know develop uh, our public services or or public infrastructure and so on so i think that's an issue it's like you know uh, ranking uh, countries based on their gdp sort of right right i, I think it, it goes back to what many of you have said here that this is a smart city really should have a, a public vision for what it should be actually, rather than just sort of relying on various actors sort of kind of randomly from their own, uh, you know, biased perspectives, creating that vision. Uh, Raika, do you have any, yeah. any comments at this point? Yeah, I would comment. Uh, well, you already brought it out, uh, the vision part actually, because uh, uh, I think it's pretty important aspect because as, as we already uh, have agreed previously, just doing pilots is not the, not the idea, but actually creating a change and uh, ch create change uh, in the sense of the citizens and the sense of the management of cities. So basically I would say that the vision, I think what we mean is the vision is that we want to create a better uh, quality living environment for the citizens. And this is what actually, you know, drives the innovations and why do we want to create the change? Because usually when we create also the change to more and more environmental solutions. This is also improvement for the public health and et cetera. There are many good reasons why also, why do we make these changes to create, uh, uh, to create easier, uh, easier uh, for example, communication with the local government and, 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 and so on. And uh, for example, as uh, Raina mentioned that I was also part of the Estonia 2035 uh, strategy project. I would say that we also had a, uh, in Estonia, we had also uh, uh, quick questions to, to the public. Uh, we had quite a lot of participants that what, what values are important. And for example, for in Estonia, nature was very important part. So nature, uh, basically clean environment, uh, these were really important aspects. I think it's, so it's a question also the citizens, what are the important aspects? I think all these solutions with transport and et cetera are actually very good solutions that create better living environment for the citizens. And this is why the, the, the question is, what, from the local, uh, local uh, cities level, that how do we uh, create these pilots into, you know, do we go to the usual incremental innovation to actually, you know, have stri striking new solutions to implement? So this is, these are the main, maybe the questions that, that, that the implementation is, level is uh, for the pilots low, maybe because the, actually the pilot or the, or the change is too little or to, to notice or, or change the quality of the service to the citizens. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we have, uh, we have roughly five minutes left of our, of our panel, so time really flies uh, in this panel discussion. So we have uh, there is loads of comments and, and, and questions in the, in the chat, so we, we don't get to them, uh, obviously, all of them. Um, but I think I wanted to ask all of you to reflect on the on COVID and the impact on, on the issues we have discussed. In the beginning of the COVID, we, there was a lot of discussion of the slowdown and the changing of the city uh, environment, really, and how perhaps cities are changing because of that. We have to really rethink the, the way we 
uh, the working, you know, work and life balances, you know, all the commuting and things like that. So I, I would like to ask, has it actually changed anything in our perspective around smart city and citizen engagement, or is it actually not at all changed? So whoever wants to start, shall I start? Who starts? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my okay. Computer froze. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, I, well, many things, of course, it changed, <laughs> it changed a lot. I think it's still changing our lives in a very dramatic way. Uh, I think it also helped us to really uh, put at the very center these actual uh, big uh, challenges. I mean, the, our, our, our um, understanding that, you know, the status quo don't really, that we need forward looking, um, radically different solutions to some of today's challenges. I mean, first of all, public health care, but also, of course, the, the climate crisis. And more than that, that we actually are going to have to move towards uh, um, maybe maybe incrementally, but, you know, we have to, to really, as we said at the very beginning, start changing behaviors at very large scale. But I was, I mean, maybe two, two main things here. I think that cities... Um, were really interesting in the way they reacted to COVID because of course they, they've been the, the main uh, cities have been hit the strongest because of social distancing, because that's where you have the uh, main density of the population uh, and that then that you had to, um, you know, to really stop the entire economy. And uh, you had lots of challenges when it comes to uh, maintaining, uh, you know, city services up and running uh, to, to maintain you know, mobility for citizens with social distancing uh, to now, you know, restart and kick off the local economy after this large interruption. And I think still a lot of cities are struggling uh, with, you know, coming back to uh, <laughs> to some form of um, city life that is, that that was um uh, before that, and of course, the rapid digitization of everything. I mean, this I would say something that probably all of you will say, but you know, smart working, distance education, uh, food delivery online, e commerce booming. I mean, of course, we had a rapid, rapid digitization of everything, and of course, the I think the difficulty there is really okay, how do we um, not only accelerate as we were saying before, but be, be, be able to, um, to say, okay, this is going to be part of the new normal, uh, distance education, uh, distance working and so on, but how do we regulate it? How do we preserve the rights? How do we make it part of our daily life? But one thing I wanted to say that I saw cities really strongly there, the network of solidarity. So I think that cities really, because the pandemic saw an increase in uh, social polarization in these equalities. I mean, from a social uh, perspective, of course, because people that don't have um, strong healthcare systems or people that are disadvantaged became even more in this pandemic, became poorer. And this is a question, of course, of work, um, access to jobs, but also uh, precarity and also gender, gender um, disequalities, which is increased a lot. I mean, in particular, in some countries now we have um, a lot of problem with uh, women uh, finding, you know, uh, decent jobs in the labor market, and uh, and of course women being at home more because of the pandemics and all these kind of uh, problems. So cities were really focused on finding uh, solidarity-based solutions for this kind of problems, uh, trying to put this, this social cohesion at the very core, you know, network of solidarities of all kind, and try to be always the one saying, uh, you know, we need uh, the green transition and the digital transition, but with social cohesion. So we do not want to um, to, to increase uh, these equalities, but we, we actually want less. So we want a different, a different uh, development model. We want a different economic and social model. And I think this is very important. And also with the next generation EU, with the recovery plans and the, mm. the resilient and recovery facility, I think cities will be absolutely critical for all the mobility transformation and the, the, the changes, as we are saying, will happen in cities. Right. We will see them in cities. So um, yeah, I think many changes there. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Signe? 
just uh, try to be very short, <laughs> so we are running out of time. And I think Francesca already underlined all these, uh, the, the new elements which have been highlighted during the pandemic, like loneliness, inequalities, uh, but even more so the inclusiveness, I think has been something uh, which is, is clearly at the, at the people's minds. Uh, and certainly if the, now the, the citizens are part of the decision uh, making then that leads to new solutions, they will also support their implementation. I just uh, like to highlight uh, perhaps a very concrete example. When we did, I mentioned the citizen engagement events uh, running up to the city's mission. Uh, in, in two of those, one in Estonia and the other one in Poland, uh, where uh, the, the citizens both, well, in the Estonian case, there were more elderly citizens and in Poland, uh, young ones. And they both uh, uh, asked, uh, well, what they wanted to see was creation of uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, urban places where people can uh, come together. Uh, also to have them in the, uh, in, um, uh, in the environment, in the parks, but also in the, in the places for the elderly people where they can really uh, come together, not just going to the shopping centers, but really something which, which brings together and which really makes them uh, uh, feel more inclusive. Thank you. Uh, Janus? Yeah, so of course COVID has uh, had a large impact on many sectors, be for example um, education, but I think both the central government and the local government have sometimes limited themselves with band-aid um, solutions so there's a saying, don't waste a good, good crisis. I think this crisis has partly been actually wasted to bring um, meaningful um, development or meaningful impact. Good, short, short, short and sweet, Raiko. Yeah, I mean, uh, Signe and Francesca had a really good uh, overview of all the aspects of the COVID that changed, but uh, Looking at the housing statistics, then also in, for example, in Estonia, uh, a lot of people moved actually outside the cities because there's no interaction. So as as uh, Signa said also that the need actually to inter uh, interact and come together is uh, definitely was on the rise. And also this is the part that we are trying to support regarding the innovation way because we're trying to create better better neighborhoods for the communities and for the people living in for example in the upper apartment buildings and this also means that we can challenge and recreate the public room that is surrounding it and this is the part that again local government right. the, the cities and uh, and uh, the citizens can come together and find the good solutions for that exactly okay last word for you uh, I think everything has been said, and thanks, Francis, for putting out quite quite well the scenery. Maybe just uh, emphasizing Janus's point that I, I think uh, we have a lot of opportunities, but then we have also lost some of the opportunities. So the, uh, we should be like all inside uh, quietly, uh, despite that the emissions are rising. Uh, we are not going to walk into shops. We are asking somebody to get the things from the shop with the car for us. So, so, so we are doing something wrong with the COVID opportunities. We should capture better. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so just to summarize some of the keywords we had heard this uh, this morning, and uh, is, is around really deceleration of technology and deceleration maybe also of you know piloting and experimentation and actually going deeper, you know, breathing in and and slowing down and actually having more meaning in cities in public spaces and also more meaningful capacity building in public sector, I think, around citizens and actually really trying to meaningfully engage them. So I, and of course, as, as Rokka said, innovation is political, and this is what you should really realize in the, in the context of smart city, that whatever we, whatever direction we innovate towards, it always has political consequences and both gender, race, and all those other issues are incre incre increasingly uh, important uh, as well. So I really thank you all of you uh, uh, for excellent interventions and excellent discussion. And uh, yeah, I give the floor back to the organizers. So it was a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. bye.